grateful for all of you for rejoining us for day two of this program. I'm looking forward today um, to sharing with you some additional content from Echoes and Reflections to help bridge our understanding of the era of the Holocaust from the historical and introduction of anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany that we started with yesterday up through kind of the evolution of the rise of the Nazi party. And then today um, introducing us to the topic of the ghettos. And so we'll be um, having that as our specific focus today. Um, I've shared with you in the chat box um, the link to the Google Doc. Um, and in that Google Doc, if you can uh, click on it, and go ahead and sign in today. If, if you were with us yesterday and provided an email, you do not need to provide an additional email today. However, if you do wanna share your Twitter handle, you can go and feel free to do that, um, as that was not an option that we had yesterday, but one of you suggested that to us, and I really appreciate that particular suggestion. Um, so again, um, Gabriel has uh, shared um, some of the uh, information in the chat box with you. And Megan, thank you for resharing that link. Uh, greatly appreciated. Um, and uh, good afternoon to you, Clarence. Good morning to you, Megan. And I know we're coming in from all over the United States. So thank you guys again for taking time out of your day to join us. Um, I'm just going to give you one more minute to um, go ahead and finish signing in. Um, and so in just a moment, we'll go ahead and get started. I thought for today, uh, it would be fun to hear about your favorite vacation spot, because I know some of us are definitely missing those vacations this year. Personally, my favorite vacation spot is Aruba. Um, it's definitely a place that I look forward to getting back to when the situation permits. I see we've got some other individuals that are fans of island life. Um, also see some other great spots, uh, North Carolina, Lake Powell, Russia. Um, I definitely, uh, if I had to pick a European country, I would probably say Poland. Um, I think it's a really beautiful spot to visit, and um, I definitely would like to get back there as well in the near future, uh, not just for the historical assets that make up that nation, but also for the ability to see the Polish countryside. And um, that's pretty awesome to know about Angela. Um, history foodies are always great to hang out with. Definitely um, enjoy being a connoisseur of that as well. Um, and so I just realized that I had my opening slide, um, I had actually ported over and not changed to today's date. So today is June 30th and it is day two. Uh, and um, I am Jennifer Goss joining you currently from Reading, Pennsylvania, but a full-time teacher in Stanton, Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley. And so excited to uh, go into the second phase of this webinar series and share with you some additional content today from Echoes and Reflections. Um, so last night, I had tasked you with a homework assignment, if you were able to complete it, reviewing some propaganda. Um, and we're gonna be revisiting that propaganda here in just a little while. Um, but before we get into that, I did want to share with you again our goals for our program together. Uh, we're going to be looking at exploring a sound pedagogy for Holocaust education further today, something we certainly started um, yesterday. Uh, and then examining instructional enhancements to support student learning, as well as classroom ready assets, which we began to look at yesterday, lesson plans, visual history testimonies, and additional primary source materials. We'll also be enhancing your personal knowledge about the Holocaust, including the history of anti Semitism, and building your confidence and capacity to teach this complex subject. And so it's with these goals in mind that I would like to introduce you to Henry Sinison. Uh, Henry is a Jewish survivor of the Holocaust, and he is an individual 
that um, I have used in my own classroom for a number of years. Um, he is somebody that um, I feel like Margaret, my students are able to connect to. And I also wanted to share his story because he provides a counterbalance of a male perspective to the female perspective that we met yesterday through that of Margaret Lambert. And so Henry was born in Berlin. And um, so he is also a, a German Jewish young man. And um, unlike Margaret, in his own household, um, his Judaism was a bit more present and uh, prevalent. And so he has an experience that is um, both similar and different to hers. And so he himself um, is, does not experience the life in the ghettos of the concentration camps because he and his brother are able to escape uh, first to France and then ultimately finding safety abroad. Um, but he has a very powerful perspective on what his life was like in the initial years of the Nazi rise to power. And so it's with that perspective in mind that I'd like to open our program today with Henry's voice. Uh, it so happened that the best school in the neighborhood where we lived in terms of uh, academic work and uh, also the most convenient was a Catholic elementary school. Now, Catholic elementary schools were uh, supported by the Catholic diocese of Berlin, but they were not, as in this country, taught by nuns or brothers. They were lay teachers. And basically, they had the same curriculum as the uh, city schools, with the exception that after regular classes, there was a class in catechism. And the Jewish kids in the school, and there were a dozen or so, uh, were excused from that, and we could go home early. And we did. Now, this was about 1931 and 1932. In 1933, when the Nazis came to power, this started to change because my classmates who were my little friends and we visited each other and played together and did our homework together and what have you must have picked up new vibrations at home because suddenly they called us dirty Jew, they called us other names uh, they would not play with us, they would not invite us. Uh, some of their parents would telephone my parents and say, I hope you understand, but if my son plays with your son and his other friends will, yeah, etc. Uh, they knew what was going on, they made excuses, but it didn't stop. Uh, it was not an official policy of the school. The teachers were very fair, they never this was never permitted in class. There was never any reference in class to anything like that, unless the public schools where the anti-Semitism had become suddenly very rampant. And that end quote from Henry might be familiar to you because it's the uh, it so happened opening that quote the best in our second unit on anti-Semitism, that suddenly it had become very rampant. Um, and so with that quote in mind, and for those of you that were able to do the exploration last night for homework, um, I'd like to go back to the mentee. Um, and the code for the mentee is in uh, the chat box. Um, it is also, or I'm putting it in the chat box now, I should say, it is also in the Google Doc that we've been using today. Um, so you are able to scroll down and see it there as well. But thinking about the propaganda that you viewed, uh, propaganda which actually came from children's books that were frequently employed in German school, what role do you think propaganda played in this change that Henry was seeing in his life? So what role did propaganda play in this change that Henry was seeing in his life?
And Gabriel has again shared the document for those of you that are just joining us. Make sure you do sign in there. Um, and then you can add your thoughts to the mentee. Speaking of mentees, um, I do have our file from yesterday of the um, results. And so I mentioned the ability to share that with all of you. So I am putting that file in the chat box. Um, if you'd like to have it to peruse later, you can feel free to download it. And if you were unable to uh, take a look at that propaganda last night, the propaganda can be found in unit two of Echoes and Reflections. Um, I had mentioned again uh, that Henry's opening quote is the one that helms unit two. Uh, and you can see that now on my screen, anti-Semitism had become suddenly very rampant. Um, and in part, propaganda is going to play a role in that. And so I'm just going to very briefly review those pieces of propaganda um, with you for those of you that are finished entering uh, the dialogue into today's mentee. Um, this particular image is the cover of the children's book, The Poisonous Mushroom. Um, and this was a book that was frequently used in German schools, one of several um, that was pushed forth by the Reich Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, and his subordinate. Um, and so you see here the, the image of the poisonous mushroom uh, and basically the context of this being that Jews are like mushrooms. You can't always tell a good Jew from a bad Jew or a good mushroom from a bad mushroom, and therefore you should be aware of all of them. The second image that is part of this collection also comes from within the poisonous mushroom. And this image here, of course, shows a man who is offering candy uh, to uh, the little children that look very Aryan. Um, and um, they are, of course, uh, being utilized to talk about the fact that you shouldn't take candy from strangers. Um, and, you know, basically the context surrounding this particular um, image is of you know the blood libel that children are going to be kidnapped and utilized for uh, the making of matzah during the Jewish Passover. And so the blood libel um, was a myth that often fueled pogroms in Eastern Europe and again was being leveraged here in Nazi Germany um, to scare children in regards to associating with Jews. Um, then you have the perpetration of religious anti-Semitism. So the previous two slides were largely social anti-Semitism, um, but a mix of religious and the last one. And this one here is outrightly religious, the myth that the Jews killed Jesus. And we have this pure Aryan multi-generational family um, looking at uh, you know, Jesus on the cross and thinking about the fact that his death was caused um, by the Jews, of course, that is a, is a false myth, but it was one that was perpetrated by the Catholic Church well into uh, the 1950s and early 1960s. Then we have here racial anti-Semitism being touted with the saying that the Jewish nose looks like a six, and six is the sign of the devil, and some other physical features. Uh, and then we also have the comparison of the Jew and the Aryan, which not only focuses on physical attributes, but also perpetrates the myth of economic anti-Semitism um, by showing the Jew as this kind of slovenly man who's carrying a stock exchange paper around, and that's how he's manipulating people, versus that of the hardworking Aryan who is shown here on the left. And that last image came from a Nazi children's book called You Can't Trust a Fox in the Heath and a Jew on His Oath a picture book for young and old. And so this was another uh, commonly utilized book um, of that time period. And I'll go ahead and put that uh, particular quote in the or uh, title in the uh, chat box. Um, you can actually, although it's somewhat controversial um, for your own educational purposes, you can find English translations of these books on Amazon. Um, so if you are interested in hearing more about um, those particular pieces of propaganda, those are avenues um, by which you can see further about the information on there. 
Um, but now I've got the Menti up and I've changed it to a different format today. This is a uh, scrolling uh, results. And one of the things that's nice about this is you don't have to worry about going up and down. The scrolling happens for you, but you can also pause it as well. Um, so propaganda um, gave a visual to the anti-Semitism agenda, embedding it in the culture. It challenges the understanding of their own lived experiences as classmates and friends and tells children what they have seen and shared is somehow wrong or bad and will eventually turn out negatively. I think that's really powerful. Um, it spread the Nazi message in a widespread and ubiquitous way. It also makes drastic ideas seem common and acceptable, especially when geared towards children. You can quickly change the opinions of neighbors and friends about family. Constant negativity would have changed people's minds about their feelings towards a particular group. Uh, and the power of the government at the time and their influence over newspapers in the media outlets. Um, it also is like switch flipping. Um, more people thought it was okay to be anti-Semitic and more overt about it, and children just absorbed it. Um, it really ingrains the ideas, it normalizes hate, uh, and lots of really great answers. So again, I will download these today and share them with you if you would like to um, see them a little bit further. Um, so from here, um, what we're going to be doing now is a 15 minute exploration of our timeline of the Holocaust. And so what I would like everyone to do um, is if you do not yet have your web browser open, I'd like you to go ahead and open your web browser. Um, I do have in our doc a, an example of, um, or excuse me, a link to the timeline, but I'm also gonna share that with you in the chat box. And I'd like everybody to go ahead and take a moment and um, open the timeline of the Holocaust. It does take a few minutes to load. It's not your um, personal internet failing in any way, shape or form. Um, this is one of the slower loading assets on our website. And it is presently loaded up on my screen. What I'd like us to do um, is I would like us to take about eight minutes and I would like you to focus on the years 1933 to 1939. I'd like you to browse through the timeline. I'd like you to take a glance at things in a more cursory fashion. But then I'd like you to, after taking that cursory glance through the timeline, which you can actually just begin with 1933, and just continue scrolling your way, uh, and it will change years for you. As, so as you can see me going um, down through, I've now switched into 1934. Like you could just kind of take a cursory glance from 1933 to 1939, and then I'd like you to go back, and I'd like you to pick one event that stands out to you as a key part of the Nazi rise to power. So in the chat box are the instructions. Take a cursory glance, at the timeline from 1933 to 1939. And then I'd like you to select and more closely examine one event that stands out to you as crucial in the Nazi rise to power. And so let's take until 26 after, oh, 27 after now, 27 after the hour and complete that exploration.
All right, your three minute warning. All right, and your one minute warning. If you'd like, you can go ahead and start sharing some of the items with us in the chat box. I'd also like to invite some of you to unmute yourselves and um, to share uh, your thoughts. Uh, if you want to raise your hand um, and do so, you certainly can. Um, or if you just unmute your mic, I can call on you in that way as well. Um, I'm seeing a lot of really great um, things in the chat box. Uh, Gabriel mentioned not necessarily a crucial event, but something that impacts students is the turning away by the United States of the St. Louis, which I think is something that's really powerful to examine. Um, one of the training um, options that we do for Echoes and Reflections is an exploration of refugees during this era with connections to modern day refugee issues with a particular emphasis on refugee issues related to Latin America. Um, and so that might be an idea for us to look at as a group in the future. Um, I see Jessica mentioning the Enabling Act gave the government the ability to abolish all other parties. And so essentially the Nazi party received 92% of the vote in what would be a one party election. Um, Rebecca mentioning the nationalized boycotts. Anytime the federal government tells you where and from whom you can shop, it starts down a hill that's hard to stop, but we're seeing this today. Um, a lot of in-depth lessons um, are difficult. And so uh, Nian mentions, you know, doing four times a week uh, with only 25 to 30 minutes for social studies can be really tough. Um, and sometimes, you know, even just throwing this timeline to your students be really helpful to allow them to examine. And Clarence, I see you're unmuted, so I'm going to go ahead and invite you to share. Oh, okay. What comes to mind, uh, hello everybody, what comes to mind is uh, there was a book that I read uh, by an author named Hannah Aaron, and she showed in that book the rise to, uh, to power, uh, uh, starting uh, by showing uh, Hitler's uh, teaching by a Jewish teacher and that uh, his, his, at the same time, his love, but it's also his hatred because of, of what occurred to him as a child that this Jewish teacher uh, instilled in him uh, uh, and he hated it, uh, the discipline and, uh, and, and also the academic uh, uh, 
esteem that this Jewish teacher had shown. And he grew up uh, seeing that the Jews uh, had a handle on both not only the style, but also the manufacturing. They were involved in various segments of the industry. And that caused him uh, at the same time as a boy to grow up uh, uh, and it affected him, uh, not only his personal life, but he used that as well to, you know, bring him to power. Yeah, Hitler, um, the the roots of Hitler's anti-Semitism are really interesting to explore. Um, a really, really outstanding set of books to read. Um, the first one, I think, is called Hubris. The second one, the name is evading me at this time, but you can also get the compilation book is by Ian Kershaw. Um, and it takes a look at Hitler and, you know, kind of what helped him be, you know, form his anti-Semitic opinions. Um, and I see Clarence too, you mentioned, you know, that particular photograph of the two boys um, exemplifying racial change and how that extension um, of hatred and anger at the Jewish race was fueled by propaganda. Um, and I think that, you know, there are several events within the timeline that really also demonstrate that as well. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, if there's anybody else that wants to share, I certainly welcome you um, to unmute yourselves or raise your hand. Um, I see Lauren mentioning the burning of books as a significant turning point. Um, Hitler had only been in office for five months and was already systematically removing an entire people's work in history. I think it's interesting that it happens even before the um, boycott. So actually the, the boycott was a month after, um, or excuse me, the boycott was a month prior. The boycott was April 1, the book burning was May, May 10th, um, but it shows how the people in power know how dangerous knowledge and free speech is. Um, I also see uh, Corey mentioning the school quota in April of 1933. Um, fascinating and sad to hear about the ways in which schools limited the numbers of Jewish students and then proceeded to teach scientific racism as part of their curriculum. Mary Ellen, if you wanna go ahead and share. Um, I was just going to comment on Lauren's um, mentioning of the book burning that when I was in Berlin, I went to the Topographie de Terrors, and, um, which was really powerful. But across the street in the um, university square is this amazing monument to about book burning where you basically look down a clear glass inset into just empty shelves. Um, and it's just really powerfully moving. It, it, it's very simple, but it was so moving and it really hit home. And I showed pictures of it to my kids when we were talking about it, so. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I think that's awesome that you were able to make that trip and then share those images with your students. Um, I know my students, the concept of the book burnings, um, I know again, I mentioned yesterday, I teach high school, 11th and 12th graders. Um, but the concept of the book burning really resonates with them because of the concepts of censorship. And, um, you know, many of them have read pieces of literature that examine issues of censorship. Um, and so it's something that stands out to them as well. And so I think your ability to bring that into your class with a personal experience is really powerful. Um, see, 1933, there's, there are so many events. I mean, the Nazis really hit the ground running, as one would say, um, with getting, um, involved in restrictions on rights of Jews. And um, somehow I'm not sure why my page just navigated to Facebook. Um, but um, basically, you know, you can see by looking at all of these events in 1933, um, how, um, you know, they're able to very slowly and effectively get um, a hold on the German population and restrict the rights of Jews. Um, one of the things that I find sometimes be a misconception with both students and um, teachers when it comes to the Holocaust is how Hitler actually comes to power. And so just wanted to review that with you very quickly. Um, Hitler was appointed, not elected, as the Chancellor of Germany. Now, Germany has a multi-party system still today. It's very different than our two-party system that we have here in the United States. Uh, but basically, the, the simplest explanation that I give to my students regarding it is that the president who in this image here at the top of my screen, Paul von Hindenburg, he was elected. Um, he actually beat out Hitler in the 1932 presidential election, although Hitler did put forth a strong showing and forced a runoff election. Um, Hitler actually, in the initial election, received 32% of the popular vote, 
which doesn't sound like a lot to students in our country with our two party system. But when you have, you know, multiple political parties running to garner 32 percent of the popular vote to what I believe was von Hindenburg's 38 percent of the popular vote was a substantial share. Um, by November of 1932, the Nazis are reaching their peak of traditionally elected power in the German Reichstag. And so von Hindenburg, in kind of that old adage of keep your friends close, but your enemies closer, decides that if he nominates Hitler and appoints him to the position of chancellor, that he can keep an eye on him and that he can keep him, you know, kind of under control. Uh, of course, we know that that, that was, idea was a spectacular failure. The Chancellor of, of Germany is in charge of the Reichstag, much like our Vice President is in charge of the U.S. Senate. Um, and so through his position as Chancellor, um, Hitler was able to manipulate the situation in ways that would ultimately lead to a establishment of a dictatorship um, upon von Hindenburg's natural death in August of 1934. Um, that's something else my students will gravitate to. They think that Hitler had von Hindenburg killed, um, which wouldn't have been terribly surprising given the fact that he killed members of his own party just a month and a half prior in the Night of the Long Knives. But uh, von Hindenburg was old. Um, he was in his mid-80s. He was tired. And that's likely also why he wasn't able to stop Hitler from manipulating the government in the fashion that he did in the aftermath of the Reichstag fire. I saw many of you keying in. Um, to the passage of the Enabling Act and then the Reichstag elections in March of uh, 1933, which were the last so-called free elections. Um, so the timeline itself is, is really wonderful. Um, it's one of our most newly created assets, and so that's why I wanted to give us the opportunity to share it with this lens today. Um, some events have like specific testimonies that are aligned with them. Others have um, videos, um, for example, the establishment of the first concentration camp in Dachau in March of 1933 has not only primary source images and testimony, but it also has this really great short little video, it's about two minutes long, um, that provides a brief overview of the Nazi camp system. Some of these assets, most of these assets are not part of the actual lesson plans of Echoes and Reflections. So the timeline for you as an educator is a whole nother resource bank that you can explore to bring different facets into your classroom. And then on the right hand side of the screen here, if you see this um, resources and downloads link, we've got some great exercises to use timelines to teach history, a um, little background on that, as well as some classroom, classroom activities. Um, if you have limited technology, because this is a little um, tech heavy, you can actually download the full timeline PDF um, and um, have that available to you just in print form. And then we also have this super handy what's called timeline asset guide. So everything that's in the timeline, whether it's a piece of visual history testimony, whether it is a student handout, whether it is a photo or a video is listed here in correlation with an event. So our first entry, Adolf Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany has uh, four items um, in the photos, artifacts, and instructional videos column. We've got the photo, which you saw on the front, of Hindenburg and Hitler and Potsdam. We've got a uh, key historical concepts in Holocaust education piece on the Weimar Republic. We have stickers with Nazi propaganda slogans as an artifact, as well as a sign calling on Germans to greet each other with Heil Hitler. And then we have an Echoes student handout on the Weimar Republic and the rise of the Nazi party. And then we also have a testimony. And if you click on the little um, blue text there, that'll take you directly to the testimony. And if you click on the blue text on the left, it will take you to the actual event on the timeline. So this is really great to review if you're like, oh, I'm teaching um, the, the boycott, the April 1st boycott. What other assets do we have? Okay, right here I can go and I can see all of these things. Or I'm you know, teaching with primary sources. What are some primary sources that I could bring in to illustrate the Nazi rise to power? I can go through this list and pick and choose the primary sources based on it. So it's a really great additional teacher um, facing resource that we make available to you on the timeline. So um, with the kind of overview of this um, part of Echoes, I do want to also take you back into our units. Um, and so to do that, I'm going to go back to the main page, again, clicking on the teach feature, and then clicking on our lesson plans. And I'm going to take you just very briefly into our unit on Nazi Germany. 
And so um, you'll see here with this particular unit, we have just like the other units, a plethora of lesson plans and other content related to the rise of Nazi Germany. I wanted to point out to you that in your um, Google Docs that I have added a link directly to this student handout, which is really great to give background to upper level students on the Weimar Republic and the rise of the Nazi party, as well as to yourself as an educator. So that's kind of a little additional piece that I wanted to share with you before we move into our next topic. Um, I also saw that Mary Ellen mentioned another asset that's in this particular um, lesson, and that is the Pyramid of Hate. Um, and I will add this to the Google Doc as well. Um, but you can see the Pyramid of Hate on the screen. This is a really powerful tool, regardless of what grade level you're teaching, which shows how simple acts like biased attitudes, accepting stereotypes, and using non-inclusive language can then escalate to greater acts like um, acts of bias and then discrimination and then bias motivated violence. And so the pyramid of hate is a tool um, that I find helpful to share with my students at the beginning of any unit um, on the Holocaust or other world genocides. And it's something that my students will often refer to and can even utilize as a tool in their own toolboxes when they're addressing um, biased acts by classmates or other individuals in their lives. And so they find it to be incredibly helpful. Um, so with that, I wanna now transition to our next question. Um, we're gonna move out of Nazi Germany. Um, oh, actually one other thing I did wanna share with you in this unit um, is the, uh, also the handout on Nazi Germany and anti-Jewish policy, which I will also add. Um, into um, our Google Doc. Another way you can utilize the timeline is to have students go through the timeline and explore it based on the pyramid of hate is how are um, anti-Jewish policies, anti-Semitic policies evolving in Nazi Germany. And then if you need a quick little handout, if you don't have time for students to actually delve into the timeline, you can go through and just look at anti-Jewish policy by year. This list is by no means conclusive. There were over a thousand different pieces of anti-Semitic legislation passed in Nazi Germany. Um, and so we certainly couldn't list all of them, but we do list some from 1933 to 1938, stopping with the Kristallnacht pogrom in November of 1938, which is often viewed as kind of the turning point of the Holocaust. And so um, I'm going to put this uh, anti-Jewish policy handout as well in the Google Doc so that you guys have that to reference as well. Um, and again, that's another thing that you can share with your students or even have them utilize to explore the timeline. Um, so Kristallnacht in and of itself is a whole nother lesson. Um, and I had thought about tying that into our work today. However, um, I know many people have somewhat of a familiarity with that um, particular event. And Echoes and Reflections actually focuses on that specific event in Unit 1, which looks at the topic of studying the Holocaust. Um, we've got a lot of really great primary and secondary sources related to Kristallnacht in that particular unit. Um, and so I didn't want to spend a ton of time on it today, but instead wanted to go into the topic of the ghettos, which I know is one um, that does not often get taught with students in some situations um, because it is not what is really heavily included in the textbooks. And so I'm linking unit one for you um, in the Google Doc as well. But at this point in time, um, I'd like to shift us into a uh, post outbreak of World War I and into the topic of the ghettos. And so with that in mind, um, I have moved our mentee forward, and I have also shared the code with you once again um, on my screen, had I not just closed my tab, so I'm getting that back open. Um, and go back into my Google Drive. I know you guys are still paused on my screen, um, but you can go into the mentee a while. And my question for you um, with the mentee is, if you asked your students, to define the term ghetto, what would they say? So if you can go to the mentee um, and uh, you simply go to mentee.com 
and you would type in the code 877802. I've advanced it to the next um, question. If you asked your students to define the word ghetto, what would they say? So what would their response be? And so I'm putting that mentee code in the box again. So if you asked your students to define the word ghetto, what would they say? All right, so let's see what we got. All right, so we got a poor area of a city, poor and dangerous neighborhood, <laughs> ratchet, I'm glad to know that's a universal word in our student vocabulary, bootleg, barrio, Yankee, and hood, rundown neighborhood, um, and working on that, thank you, poor black neighborhood. They definitely make a connection to modern context, possibly as an adjective or a noun, a uh, place where a lot of low class poor people live, if pressed to describe conditions, they'd use words like dirty, cramped, and poor, they'd say ratchet or unfair. Um, and sixth grade students might giggle nervously introducing the term, um, but they would say that it's a place where poor people live where there's crime and poverty. Uh, Detroit, Michigan, even though most students haven't been there, uh, where I grew up, um, somebody who lacks what others have being poor, having off-brand terms, poor area of a big city where African Americans live. Many of them would probably define it based on its current cultural usage in the U.S. as being bad or broken down. A place where urban poor live where the crime rate is high and drug use is rampant. Um, and so, yeah, those are the same types of, uh, of terms that um, my students would use as well. And Mary Ellen, I've been to Detroit and I don't think it's, I don't think it's ghetto. I've been to some great, great places there in Detroit, but the kids refer to it as comparative Gabriel Mentis as well. For example, the ghetto mall as opposed to the wealthy mall. So I share with my students, I always, I always start with that and they always, you know, kind of even juniors and seniors laugh nervously. And I say, you know, what's a ghetto? And that's, you know, some of the same stuff they say. And so from there, I then go into the Echoes and Reflections audio glossary, which I had shared with you all yesterday. Um, I click on G and I simply scroll down and say, well, during the era of the Holocaust, um, we've got here the definition of sections of towns and cities, mostly in Eastern Europe, the German occupation authorities and their allies used to concentrate, exploit, and often starve local and regional Jewish populations. Jews from Central and Western Europe were also sent to some of the ghettos, as were some Roma. And so um, they say, you know, okay, that's, that's definitely different than the definition that I have today. Um, I also will sometimes have them pull out a dictionary um, and they'll see that it's a place where people are forced to live due to social and or economic conditions, which is definitely true in modern society. But here as well, you know, the social condition of being Jewish dates back to the Middle Ages when the concept of ghettos was initially introduced. From there, I'm going back now to Echoes and Reflections lesson plans, and our unit four focuses solely on the experience in the ghettos. And so um, the opening quote here um, is from Ellis Lewin, who we're going to meet in just a moment, and he calls the ghettos the beginning of the end. Before I get into Ellis's testimony, the first thing I actually share with them is this map. And remember from yesterday, it's easier to see the map if you click on the printable version. So that's what I've got up on my screen right now. Um, I'm also going to put a link to this uh, version in the chat box. And so you'll have the ability to get that there. Um, but I'd like you to just take a moment and study it and see, is there anything about it that stands out to you? I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. Um, the dots, the larger the dot, the larger the size of the ghetto. Um, and then the dots also correlate, if you scroll down to the bottom, um, to when the ghettos were actually created. Excuse me, scroll up to the top. Um, so they're colored by the year that they were created. Um, the dark Color is uh, from 1939, blue 1940, orange 1941, purplish from 1942, green from 1943, and the blackish gray from 1944. Just take a moment and what stands out to you? 
looking at this map and recognizing where the ghettos are located and what might stand out to your students. Right. Yeah, Rebecca mentions they're not in Germany. Okay, not in Germany. Poland is peppered with them, Lindsay mentions. Right. The largest one is in Warsaw, it has 500,000 Jews in it. Um, heard anywhere from 450 to 500,000. Any other interesting thoughts? Concentration and death camps are on the periphery. There's a big one in Prague. Yeah, so uh, there are a lot more than students suspect. And yeah, gosh, this map is just scraping the surface. USHMM did a study um, about seven or eight years ago, uh, and they've embarked on a project to document every single concentration forced labor camp and ghetto in Nazi occupied Europe. Um, if you visit USHMM today, the third floor will still tell you that there were approximately 450 ghettos. However, USHMM is in the process of redoing their permanent exhibition. And one of the things that they're targeting is the fact that that statistic is wrong. Um, they, they now estimate that there were anywhere from 38, 40,000 ghettos and concentration camps in Nazi occupied Europe. And um, some ghettos lasted for just a couple of days. Some ghettos lasted for several years. Uh, Rebecca makes a, an interesting point about mapping railroads and seeing if ghettos and rail lines overlap. Um, not so much as concentration and, and death camps and rail lines, but yes, there were some ghettos that were located along rail lines. Um, Trajanstadt, just north of Prague, was one that was located there in part due to its proximity to a rail line. Um, because many of the Jews from Germany were initially taken to Theresian Stadt, particularly wealthy um, and elderly Jews. Um, and and Theresian Stadt is a study in and of itself. Um, Clarence mentions they're located in manufacturing sites. Yeah, some ghettos, um, the ghettos that lasted the longest were often the ghettos that um, existed to provide labor to nearby manufacturing sites. Um, I also point out to students that this map is a little bit different than the one that we looked at yesterday because it's showing you uh, Nazi occupied Europe during the war years. So the border of Germany is much larger than it had been in 1933 and even prior to 1938. Um, and if you would compare this map to the map that we looked at yesterday, you would see um, that there is a substantial correlation between where pre-war Jewish populations were and where ghettos were located. Um, and so that is something that I think is critical for our students to understand uh, and identify. And so that is something that I would definitely promote util utilizing in your own classrooms if you can make that connection between that pre-war Jewish map to the establishment of the ghettos. And we're gonna talk more about that impact tomorrow uh, when we take a look at the final solution. So, uh, one other um, point uh, to make, again, the students is one that was mentioned, and that is that there were no ghettos in Germany. Um, this is believed to be in part because they did not want to expose Germans to um, the disease um, that often came along with the cramping of so many people into a confined space. Um, and so they, and also the, the visual existence of the ghettos themselves. So that's why another reason why they were mainly located. Um, in Eastern Europe, um, with the exception of the Theresienstadt ghetto, which was a so-called model ghetto um, in Czechoslovakia, the former Czechoslovakia. Um, so the very last thing I want to do today um, that we are going to have time for is to take a look at the testimony of Ellis Lewin. Um, and Ellis Lewin uh, is one of my favorite testimonies in Echoes and Reflections. He's going to talk to us about his experience in the ghetto the Woods Ghetto, which is the ghetto located in the city where he was born. Um, he was placed in the Woods Ghetto at about nine years old. Um, and we're going to also revisit Ellis's testimony tomorrow when we explore the final solution. It was uh, the beginning of the end of survival, of, of, of becoming a different, uh, uh, a different existence, totally different 
uh, human being, uh, another, another world. That world was just fast and faster disappearing. I was constantly kept inside. I was, was not to go out. So I was like inside forever. And we started living inside. When any playing we did as children, we did inside. There was no, no outside anymore. And uh, the stories then were changing, you know, from Hitler invading to what we're going to do and how we should have done it. Now it's, it's here. And, uh, and uh, now, how do, now what do we do and what's going to happen tomorrow? It was no longer next week or uh, 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 what should we have done a year ago. Now we're confronted with, a, um, with the devil himself. And, uh, and uh, no matter how I imagine how badly they, any, anyone perceived what was going to happen, turned out infinitely greater so that um, uh, we were instantly cut off from everything. And uh, the, uh, the uh, instant uh, brutality, the instant uh, uh, orders, the instant uh, change, uh, it was not a, a, a slower a way of, of introducing you into, into that kind of a existence. It was like the door shutting on you and that's it. Okay, so to conclude this final activity, um, I'd like you to just ponder a moment or two on what Ellis shared with us and how it helps you better understand the experience of life in the ghettos. And then feel free to share um, some thoughts on that in the chat box. And also if there's anybody who would wanna share out loud, feel free to raise your hand or unmute your mic. I'd be happy to hear some voices. All right, Mary Ellen. I'm not very good at typing because my arm's in a sling. Um, so uh, it made me think right away of um, Elie Wiesel's night because the sense of how people just didn't believe it was going to happen and it wasn't going to happen and then suddenly it was on them and it really, really was powerful reading that. So it reminded me of that. Thank you. Yeah, I love using Ellis's voice. Um, with the experience of Ellie Wiesel because there's some there's some similarities and differences and so I think for me when I teach night I always bring Ellis in because it helps to broaden student perspective so thank you very much for for sharing that um, and again if you have any other thoughts you can feel free to share them in the chat box um, I see Teresa mentioning first-person testimony always gets students attention Laura mentions sad um, uh, or Rebecca mentions it's sad. Laura mentions how sudden the change was, and that's so interesting. And I think one of the things that's really interesting to unpack with this, and if we had had more time, I would show you the testimony of Joseph Morton, um, which is located right below that of Ellis Lewin in Unit 4. Um, Joseph is experiencing this as an adult, and he doesn't view it as a sudden change. Um, and so I think that that's really fascinating um, because children, I think, were more insulated from the experience. Um, so what I would like to, to task you with for homework um, is uh, to explore more deeply in this ghettos lesson. Um, and you're going to see a multitude of additional testimonies. You are also going to see um, uh, pieces of uh, poetry. You're going to see photographs. And I'm sharing with you in the chat box, and it's also a link to it is located in the Google Doc a primary and secondary source uh, graphic organizer. Um, this is fully fillable as a PDF, so you can do it on your computer, or if you're old fashioned like me and like to print stuff out and write on it, you can do that. But I'd love to task you with tonight, going through some of the other content in this lesson on the ghettos, and just picking three items, an additional piece of testimony, an image, a poem, or perhaps even a secondary source reading on ghettos, and I'd like you to fill out that graphic organizer, and that's going to be our starting point tomorrow. Uh, the focus of tomorrow's session is going to be looking at the um, final solution and liberation. 
Um, if you have any questions or issues that you'd like me to address tomorrow, whether it's related to something that we've already talked about, or it's a, a topic that you just always wanted to know something more about, um, I have put one more question up for you in the mentee um, as kind of our closing question. Um, and so you can feel free to visit that mentee on your way out today and just type in if there's anything that you definitely want me to address. Um, I see some really fantastic additional thoughts on the ghettos um, and I appreciate you guys sharing those. I will um, also um, once again save the uh, mentee PDF and send that out to you guys. Um, but I really appreciate your active participation today and am looking forward to our final day together tomorrow. Um, I will be able to remain on for a few minutes if there are any additional questions. But again, thank you, Gabriel, for having me. And I look forward to seeing y'all tomorrow.